Good morning. This is the House Healthcare Committee again, uh, meeting on February 10th. We are continuing our work this morning on issues of health disparities. And between now and noon, we will be focusing our attention on a House bill that has House Bill 210, which was just introduced uh, on the floor yesterday. And what we'll be doing this morning is first hearing from uh, Representative China, member of our committee, who's also the lead sponsor for the bill. Uh, after uh, Representative China sets some context for the bill and introduces the bill, uh, we'll turn to our legislative counsel, Katie McLynn. Um, we will not be going through everything line by line, uh, but we'll and the, we'll come back to the findings at another time to look more closely. But some of our witnesses will also be speaking to the findings. But Katie, I would hope that you can give us a general introduction to the the, the key areas of the bill, um, but not necessarily a line by line description at that point. If we can do that. Uh, so that we understand what the components of the bill are. And then most importantly today, uh, we have a number of witnesses uh, who have made themselves available to speak to the development of the bill and the importance and issues in the bill. So um, my inclination is for us to hear our witnesses before we take committee questions, because I think the priority is to hear from our witnesses this morning. So with that, again, I'm looking around, looking around my screen, and um, I think we're set to go. So with that, uh, Representative China, Brian, I welcome you to, uh, as the sponsor of House Bill 210, to uh, begin our uh, testimony this afternoon. Thanks. If we were in person, I would be saying, for the record, this is Brian Chena, um, state representative from Burlington, but everyone knows that now because it's on Zoom, on YouTube. Um, so thanks everyone for giving us a chance um, to present this bill today to the committee. Um, so I'd just like to start by saying, um, and thanks to our witnesses for making times out of your lives to come here today without compensation, it's much appreciated. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge all of the labor that's done by black and brown people that they're not compensated for in our society and haven't been compensated for for 400 years. Um, so thank you all for making time today to come here. Um, so the, the public health emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year has amplified the inequities of our health care system. Hold on, I'm hearing some feedback. So I'm just, hmm. That is, I think, can everyone else mute themselves? Maybe that's what it was. Okay. <clears throat> if someone's using two devices, that sometimes creates a feedback loop and that's maybe what we're hearing. Uh, I don't know if anyone is on two devices, but if you are, if you could somehow arrange to be on one device, that would be helpful. Thank you. I think it's better now, whatever it was. So I'm gonna start over because that was distracting for me, sorry. Um, so the public health emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year has amplified the inequities of our healthcare system associated with the public health emergency of racism, which has gone on for 400 years. Although the ethic of medicine traditionally stated primum non nocere, to first do no harm, the healthcare system has created harm and reinforced the suffering that many people have faced in our society who are black, indigenous, or other people of co color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning or queer, and people with disabilities. For hundreds of years, many of us have had to learn to take care of ourselves and each other when the system failed us. In the context of this pandemic, we've taken a long, hard look at the inequities and disparities that exist, and we ask ourselves, can we make the system better? The Wellness Committee of the Racial Justice Alliance, of which I am a member, started meeting last summer to explore ways to meet the health and wellness needs 
of, of BIPOC, especially black people differently from both within the existing healthcare system and from outside of the systems of our government. This work has included discussion about different approaches to training providers so that they could serve patients better. We also looked at access to all kinds of resources and the role that social determinants of health play in the lives of black indigenous and other people of color. We considered ways to provide support through BIPOC led wellness centers, which would be grounded in traditional cultural methods of healing and collective liberation. While considering the need for alternatives, we also acknowledge the need to provide better care for people within the existing healthcare system. We recognize that there were fundamental systemic problems with the structure of our healthcare system that could be improved from within. So we began working on this bill, H210, as one way to address healthcare equity. The bill was created by combining our concerns and our research over the summer and fall with pieces of a federal level bill that has not yet passed called the Health Equity and Accountability Act of 2020. And you can feel free to look that up and compare our bill to that bill. In our bill, so there's pieces of that that we took and there's pieces of that that we left behind because we felt that they were um, unrealistic or um, that they reinforced systemic oppression versus, versus um, undoing it. So we took the pieces that we thought worked and we combined them with our ideas to create the bill that's before you today. And, the, and this bill seeks to establish the Office of Health Equity. It seeks to establish the Health Equity Advisory Commission. It issues grants for the promotion of health equity. Collect, seeks to collect data to better understand health disparities in Vermont and requires additional education on cultural competence in the practice of medicine. The bill was fast tracked because the committee was going to take it up so soon. So there's a few changes that didn't make it into the draft that I would advocate the committee make if we were to act on this bill, which um, quickly are that there's a post, supposed to be a piece about the professional education of other healthcare professions that didn't, doesn't seem to have made it in um, that needs to be there. And also um, there's been some work out in California on anti-racist training for healthcare providers. So I think we should look at that and, and consider that in the piece around training for providers. So next we will have Katie McClinn from Ledge Council walk us through the bill to explain the mechanics of how this bill takes some steps towards our goal of addressing equity in the healthcare system. And after Katie, I will introduce some other witnesses, each, uh, with a, um, each who are going to um, share their perspectives on why we need this bill. Um, and like Chair Lippert said earlier, um, Katie McClinn is not going to give a detailed walkthrough of the findings. Some of our guests will refer to the findings and talk about the data, um, and we will make time in the future, hopefully, to dig into the findings and look more at the body of evidence supporting the need for this bill. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Katie and just say thank you so much for your hard work um, trying to get this bill together quickly because we had been working on it at the usual pace and then we had to step it up. So thank you for your diligence and effort to get this done by today. So thank you and take it away, Katie. Thank you, Katie McLinn, Office of Legislative Counsel. It's nice to see everyone this morning. Um, before I pull up the document and share my screen, I always think it's helpful to take a step back and kind of get the big picture view of what we're about to look at when we look at the words. Um, so as Representative Chena already indicated, this bill that we're about to look at creates an Office of Health Equity within the Department of Health and there's a director position that's created within that office. The bill also establishes the Health Equity Advisory Council to provide advice to the commissioner, to the General Assembly and state government. There's language about um, issuing grants for the promotion of health equity and the criteria um, that somebody who's applying for one of those grants would have to meet to receive a grant. Um, there's also language about how to collect data in a way that would help us as a state better understand health disparities in Vermont. And lastly, there's language that has to do with continuing medical education and cultural competence. Um, and then one last point, um, this morning, we've focused a lot of our time um, on hearing about race and ethnicity. And this bill, when we talk about um, disparity and establishing health equity, 
um, takes uh, an even broader view than race and ethnicity. It focuses on the LGBT community as well, and also persons with disabilities. So that's something to keep in mind as we um, turn to the language. So I will attempt to share my screen now. How did I do? Do you see the document? We do. All right. Um, so there are, um, there is quite a lengthy finding section. So I'm gonna scroll past it for the time being. Um, and the finding section is followed up by a section on legislative intent and purpose. And I'm also going to skip over that for today. Um, I would encourage- the legislative remember, intent and purpose. As, as Katie's scrolling, I would encourage members to take a time to read through the findings and the legislative intent uh, if you haven't had a chance to do so as well, but we're not going to focus there this morning, as Katie said. Great, thank you. So that brings us to chapter, excuse me, section three, which creates a whole new chapter in Title 18, the health title on health equity. And the first section is a definition section. I won't go through each definition, but um, there are a lot of terms that come up repeatedly throughout this chapter cultural competency in the practice of medicine is defined, health disparity and health equity come up again and again throughout this chapter, health equity data, non-white, who are we referring to when we refer to non-white, um, race and ethnicity is defined and also social determinants of health. So I'm happy to come back and look at those in a little more detail with the committee. So the second section of the bill has to do with establishing an office of health equity. So as I said earlier, it's established within the Department of Health and the role of this office is to advise the Commissioner of Health, the Governor, the General Assembly on matters affecting health equity. And the office is to serve in a coordinating, educating and capacity building role for the state and local public health programs and community-based organizations that promote health equity um, by implementing strategies tailored to address varying complex causes of health disparities. Then we go on uh, to say that the health, the office shall work collaboratively with the department and affected stakeholders to set priorities, collect and disseminate data and align resources within the department and across state agencies. And then in subsection B1, we start listing the powers and functions of the office. And I think this is important. So I'll spend a little time here. Um, so the office is to lead and coordinate the department's health equity efforts. The office is to publish data reports documenting health disparities, provide education to the public on health equity, health disparities, and social determinants of health, build capacity within communities to offer expand public programs to better meet the needs of individuals who are Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, individuals who are LGBTQ and individuals with disabilities, conducting state-level strategic planning to eliminate health inequities, provide technical assistance to the Department of Health in carrying out its programming and coordinating um, and staffing the Health Equity Advisory Council, which we'll look at a little further in the bill, building collaborative partnerships with communities to identify and promote health equity strategies, providing grants to community-based organizations. And this is something, again, that there's a whole standalone section on providing grants. So we'll look at that in more detail later on developing a statewide plan for increasing the number of individuals for black, indigenous, and persons of color, individuals who are LGBTQ and individuals with disabilities in the healthcare profession, including recommendations for financing mechanisms and recruitment strategies necessary to carry out the plan, working collaboratively with UVM's College of Medicine and other healthcare professional training programs to develop courses that are designed to address the problem of disparities, um, and then the last item is subdivision L, developing curricula and the provision of continuing education courses to teach cultural competency and the practice of medicine. So those were the responsibilities and functions of the office. And then we get to this list online too, which are things that the office may do. Um, they're not required to do it, they may do it. So the um, office may hire personnel as the director of health equity, we're gonna hear more about in a minute, um, deems necessary in, in consultation with the commissioner. 
The office may apply for and accept any grant of money from the federal government, private foundations, or other sources that could be available to programs related to the office's um, function. The office may serve as a designated state agency for a seat of federal funds specifically designated for programs. And the office may enter into contracts with individuals, organizations, and institutions necessary for the performance of its duties. So next we get to the part about um, who is running the office. So the office is run by the Director of Health Equity. This person is appointed by the Commissioner of Health and is serving at the pleasure of the Commissioner until the appointment of the Director's successor. And the Director of Health Equity is to have specific experiences. So this is um, who is eligible for this position. This is a list of eligibility. In subdivision 2A, the person has to have a lived experience of oppression or discrimination or both based on race, ethnicity, perceived mental condition, or LGBTQ or disability status or any combination thereof. Um, demonstrated experience addressing inequities in a range of political and professional environments. Experience in equity advocacy or systems change efforts. Experiencing measuring and monitoring program evaluation activities and working in multidisciplinary partnerships. Demonstrated success in the administration of community education or social programs that focus in part on the elimination of structural racism, including at least two years in a managerial supervisory or program administration capacity. Strong understanding of the root causes of inequities and social determinants of health and a strong understanding of health inequities and disparities in Vermont. Next in subsection D, this is language about a report that every year the office is to submit a report to the governor and to various committees of the General Assembly. Um, the report is to address projects and services developed and funded by the office and include recommendations for administrative or legislative action. And lastly, the authorized, excuse me, the office is authorized to seek assistance and avail itself of the services of employees of any state agency, department, board, bureau, or commission as it may require and as may be available for its purposes. And all um, state entities are authorized and directed to cooperate with the Office of Health Equity to the extent consistent with law. So next we move away from the office and turn to the advisory commission that um, was mentioned earlier. So this language creates a health equity advisory commission to monitor health equity throughout Vermont and provide the Office of Health Equity with recommendations and guidance. And then we have a list of members of the advisory commission. It's a very long list. Um, yeah. And in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through each particular to member. Yeah. But again, I would um, So subsection two, I would just encourage members to take a look because it's a, it's a list that's important to understand, but let's not take the time right now. Thank you. Great, okay. The next subdivision um, talks about how members are appointed and the length of their terms. There's a staggered term. Um, so members um, terms wouldn't all expire at the same date. Um, the language talks about how vacancies are filled and it also mentions that members are eligible for reappointment. And then most importantly, the duties of the advisory commission. Um, the advisory commission is to review and make recommendations to the Office of Health Equity um, on any rules or policies proposed by the office, um, conduct statewide hearings on issues of concern to the health interests of individuals who are black, indigenous, persons of colors, individuals who are LGBTQ, individuals with a disability, review, monitor, and advise all state agencies regarding the impact current and emerging state policies, procedures, practices, laws, and rules on the health of individuals and the affected population. Identify and examine the limitations and problems associated with existing laws, rules, programs, and services related to health. Advise the office on, award, on the awarding of grants and the development of programs and services required under the chapter advising the office on the needs, priorities, programs, and policies relating to the office, um, relating to the health of individuals within the population identified in this bill, and also providing any other assistance to the Office of Health Equity as may be requested by the director. So we have that the advisory commission um, receives assistance 
from the Office of Health Equity. The advisory commission is to submit an annual report um, to various committees of the General Assembly. And subsection F sets up how the meetings are to run. The director of health equity calls the first meeting by September of this year. And then annually, the advisory commission is to select a chair and vice chair from among its membership. Um, the advisory council is to meet bi-monthly. And there's some circumstances as to who can call a meeting if one is not being called. Um, all meetings are open to the public. There is language in subsection G about the acceptance of grants and contributions. And there's all, so, excuse me, also language in subsection H about um, per diem compensation and reimbursement for members participating in the meeting. And you'll see on line seven that that's limited to six meetings annually. So moving away from the advisory council now, our next section deals with um, grants. Um, so there's intent language. It's the intent of the General Assembly to provide grants that stimulate the development and community-based and neighborhood-based projects that improve health outcomes for individuals who are Black, Indigenous, persons of color, individuals who are LGBTQ, and individuals with disability. So the grants um, are administered by the Office of Health Equity. You'll see there's a cross-reference to that subsection, or excuse me, that sub that section. And then there's a list of um, what the office's responsibilities are with regard to this grants program. So the office is responsible for publicizing the availability of grants and establish an application process, provide technical assistance and training, including convening meetings for grant recipients, developing uniform data reporting requirements for the purpose of evaluating performance of grant recipients, measuring outcomes, developing and monitoring a process to evaluate progress in meeting grant objectives, and coordinating with existing community-based programs in the state and local level to avoid duplication of effort. Um, next, there's language um, that any individual entity or organization within the state can apply for a grant um, as long as it that, um, comports with the different criteria set forth in this section. Um, and then, Let's see, the applications, the applicants are to submit their grant to the office. A grant proposal is to include the following elements. Um, so I'll try to hit this as a high level, um, but the purpose and objective for the grant. Um, and then there are certain um, goals that the grant would have to address, decreasing health disparities for certain populations, improving social determinants of health for um, the population identified in the bill, identifying um, the, and relevance to the target community, methods for obtaining baseline health status data, mechanisms for mobilizing community resources, mechanisms and strategies for evaluating project objectives, proposed work plans. Um, and based on this information that a, a applicant would submit to the office, the office is to give priority in awarding proposals um, excuse me, awarding grants to proposals that demonstrate broad-based local support and commitment from individuals who are Black, Indigenous, and persons of color, individuals who are LGBTQ, and individuals with a disability. Um, priority to um, grants that propose uh, multi-dimensional ways, individuals who are Black, Indigenous, persons of color, individuals who are LGBTQ, and individuals with disability experience disabilities. Uh, that demonstrate a commitment to quality in all aspects of project administration and implementation and priority to grants that incorporate approaches to achieve sustainable reductions and disparities. So that is the grant section. And then the next section of this chapter has to do with data collection. This section says that each state agency department board commission that collects any health related data um, individual data shall include its data collection, health equity data disaggregated by race, ethnicity, gender identity, age, primary language, socioeconomic status, disability, and sexual orientation. And that data related to race and ethnicity shall use separate data collection categories and tabulations in accordance with the recommendations of the director of health equity and in consultation with the advisory committee. And in subsection B, we move into language about how it should be analyzed. So the department is to systemic, systematically 
analyze such health equity data using the smallest appropriate units of analysis feasible to detect racial and ethnic disparities, as well as disparities along the lines of the categories that we just looked at in subsection A. Um, so it says to do this periodically, but not less than biannually. And the data is to be available to the public in accordance with state and federal law. And in addition to this, um, there's to be a report every year by the Department of Health um, containing the results of the analysis conducted pursuant to this um, subsection. And that report is to go to various committees of the General Assembly. The last substantive um, section that we have of this bill, I should say that's the end of the chapter that's being created on health equity. And then this last section is an amendment to existing law that governs um, continuing med medical education requirements. Um, so the Board of Medicine um, is currently re required to have a minimum of 10 hours of continuing medical education by rule. So this expands this to be um, the current requirement to be 12 hours. And there's specific language that says two hours are to include uh, cultural competency in the practice of medicine component. And then we have um, a definition of cultural competency. It's the same definition that appears earlier in the bill in the definitions section um, of the chapter we just looked at. But because this is in a completely different title of the VSA, we're repeating it here. So um, it's the same, same statute just appearing in two different titles. And that is it. The effective date is July 1 of this year. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Um, and let's turn let's turn to hearing from our witnesses. And uh, Representative Chena, would you like to introduce the witnesses? Yes. So we have. I'm looking at who's actually here right now, and it's um, unclear. Is who is who is using the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance account right now? Is that Mark and Christine? Is it just Mark or just Christine? Thank you, Representative Chena, and good afternoon. Uh, Committee, uh, Mrs. Hughes. Wait, I, I was just checking who was there, Mark. I, so hold on. So that's Mark. So we've got, what's that? I says, I'm trying to tell you that Mrs. Hughes is in the room. Oh, my bad. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so we've got Christine Hughes and Mark Hughes. We've got Reverend Christopher Cockrell. We've got Mayumi Cornell. And we've got Reverend Roy V. Hill. Roy, I think you're a reverend too, right? People call me minister. A minister Roy V. Hill. So um, so I think the order we're going to go in um, that we had established was going to be uh, Christine Hughes. Oh, and Pat Ottilio is here. Sorry, the screen is scattered. So um, I did see you move, though. Um, so I think the order we were going to go in was we were going to start off with Christine Hughes. So are you ready to go, Christine? I am, Brian, and I'm just going to say hi with my video and then turn it off because it's easier for me to just have you hear what I'm saying and not be on video as long as that's okay with everybody. Just wanted to show you that I'm here and I'm a real person. Thank you. And I think we'll ask everyone else to mute because I see some people had a, might have unmuted. Um, so everyone mute and then Christine, go, go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Chena. Thank you all um, that are here today. Um, I'm just going to read my testimony. It's kind of hard. I've been here before testifying for other uh, racial justice legislation, and um, it actually takes a lot to show up, aside from taking time away from work. Um, it's, just, it's, it's just difficult to do this, so thank you and bear with me. Um, happy Black History Month, brave little state legislators. I'm here to today to testify in support of the Racial Justice Alliance's healthcare bill, H210. I've lived in Vermont since 1974 when I was a child. I survived the Burlington school system and lots of other uh, racial aggressions um, against me, my family, brothers and sisters, children, grandchildren. I began standing up for racial justice in Burlington when I was about 16 years old in 1982, when um, at a rally on City Hall steps, 
to protest the KKK's plans to hold a gathering in Southern Vermont. I was afraid then, and in 2021, I'm even more afraid. I don't feel safe in Vermont. I'm often asked, where are you from? Or what brings you to Vermont? The translation is, you don't belong here. We all witness what happened to Kaya Morris and Tabitha Moore, and it's frightening. Our attorney general called the hate speech hate speech and racial harassment of a family with children freedom of speech. He failed to protect Kaya and her family. I've been leading the Racial Justice Alliance's wellness working group for about six months. It has grown and I'm so honored to be part of that work. A lot of people and a lot of work has gone into the legislation that we're talking about today. Um, we've worked really hard. Thank you, Representative China, for your work and for all the other folks that have put in a lot of time and energy to this. Um, this is a personal matter for me that has to be dealt with in a business forum. That's difficult. Um, like I said, I took some time uh, away from work and I've done this many times basically to help you do your job. And rather than bearing my soul to feed the white appetite for trauma tourism that plagues Vermont social justice spaces where people have good intentions, but no real will to make change. I have a few questions for you. You can answer them on your own time and as part of your internal process. What have you done to learn about the unmet physical and mental health needs of black and brown Vermonters? Do you understand the phrase policy violence? Are you equipped? to look at existing policy or policy you create through a racial justice lens. Just like all Americans, you've not only been taught and brainwashed, you've been consciously, you have consciously bought into the myth of white supremacy because it benefits you politically, economically, culturally, and even maybe genetically. Vermont, just like the rest of the world, is browning. I understand that not supporting this legisla legislation or whitewashing it benefits you. I understand that doing nothing benefits you. The status quo is your comfort zone. Taking risks that may compromise your political aspirations with your base impacts your decisions. I know it is fear that presents you from doing the new right thing instead of the old white thing. I also know decisions made out of fear are based in cowardice, selfishness, and are sadly predictable in Vermont. Trump is a, is a symptom of a deeper problem that has come to light. I believe there is little Trump in all of you, and I know many of you have Trump-type relatives. All it took was a phone call to a police, to the police over a $20 bill by a racist store owner to spur the televised murder of George Floyd at the hands of police to put systemic racism into the national conversation. The resulting Black Lives Matter peaceful protests, national organizing of millions of people, and a deadly mob of mainly white racist Trump supporters attacking the Capitol to force many whites to take a look at the reality we suffer from every day of our lives. How long will that last? If you acknowledge the existence of systemic racism anywhere, you are acknowledging that it exists everywhere. I'm not talking about implicit bias, unconscious prejudice, or other whitewash words and excuses for individual behaviors used to justify the individual role you play in perpetuating systems that benefit you. As a woman of color, I can't afford to care how you feel about me on an individual level. Thankfully, I don't need your approval or affirmation to exist or to tell the truth. I do care that you as elected officials have a history of being complicit through your inaction and poor stewardship over your power. This is an urgent and real need to change 400 year old systems that are by design causing harm to a specific group of people right now. Some people have 30 year plans because they see dollar signs. We don't. Black and brown descendants of slaves are an unprotected, vulnerable population. Look at our police, court, incarceration, 
land, wealth, and home ownership data if you haven't already. It tells an undisputable story. Your numbers don't lie, do they? Finally, I ask you to consider what I'm going to tell you as I finish. It is something to help you examine more deeply the intricacies of the constructs of systemic racism. If you were embrace the truth in what I'm about to say, it will at least enhance and at best transform your limited understanding of the harmful role of racist beliefs. It is the collection of these beliefs that underpin the oppressive caste system we all, we call American society that tells us we should just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. This moment is hopefully a teachable one. When we were developing the language of this bill, we had to face the reality that all the other groups have to be included in order for it to pass. Black American people can't demand progress without carrying other groups along the way. Kind of reminds me of slaves preparing food for their owners before they could eat the leftover crap off their tables. Why is that true? Is being black a disability? Is being black a lifestyle choice or sexual preference? Is being black a crime? And what the hell is BIPOC? Is being black a lifetime sentence of poverty wages to feed Vermont's dairy industry and keep Ben and Jerry's in business? Why do so many other groups enjoy your support economically, politically, and why are they so easily afforded space to stand alone with a single singular group identity? Why do new Americans, LBGT, disability community, migrant workers hesitate to stand with us and as they establish themselves, eventually distance themselves from us? As white privileged people, you don't have to give, give the caste system dynamics any thought. They have been designed by your people for you. Even sex offenders with developmental disabilities have a law that protects them. Act 248 enacted in 1987. And, and most of you know about all the state funds and support that have been invested in COSA programs, which are also designed for sex offenders as they're released from prison. Indigenous people, many of whom acculturated historically into whiteness and owned slaves, have land grants and political power because politically it works. Why is that? Do European immigrants in America need your help? Why not? Why is it an either or conversation instead of an and proposition? If the newly formed reparations task force in Burlington makes recommend recommendations a year from now, and it will, where will you stand on that? What political or economic power do black and brown descendants of American slaves have? The descendants of American slave are slaves are still expected to take whatever crumbs fall off the master's table while immigrants and so-called new Americans and every other non-white able-bodied group enjoys a preferred minority status. Why? The descendants of slaves are the people whose lives, labor, culture, roots and civilization, music, art, wombs, resilience and existence have been the key ingredients aside from white greed that makes America a superpower. With economic and political superiority in the global scene. Vermont never actually abolished slavery. Read PR2 if you don't understand that. Why is there so much resistance to us establishing our own singular identity and political agenda? Why is that? Do you have the mental bandwidth and moral courage to examine and recognize these things? Am I making you uncomfortable? Even though there are not a lot of us in the state of Vermont, our lives, our medical needs, our wellness matters. If anything I have said disturbs, or better yet, disturbs, disrupts your comfort zone, I've done my job. When I see something, I will say something. Your public servants do your job. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Christine Hughes. Um, so next, we have Mayumi Cornell. Are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready to go. All right, thanks for joining us today. Take it away. Uh, good morning, um, all. I am Mayumi Cornell. I am 44 years old, and I am a native Vermonter. Um, 
when I was about 28 years old, I was getting a mental health evaluation done. And they seemed much more concerned with the fact that I was African-American and overweight than they were about the fact that I was concerned about how I was treating my child in terms of my parenting. It seems to be a recurring theme that any time I would ask for help with my mental health, it took a long time to get what I needed. Now, I can't say that's definitely because I'm African-American or whatever the reason is. I'll leave you to draw your own conclusion. The only thing that I can say is, is that I'm able to speak for myself, but there are people who are not able to speak for themselves, who cannot articulate what they're feeling and why. And so I'm telling you that even if they were not concerned with my parenting, I was, I still am. Both of my children, myself and my mother all have mental health issues. My mother killed herself when I was 11. So for me, mental health is not something that I can put on a shelf and take it down when I feel like it. It's an everyday matter for me. Questions or not? We're, we're going to hold questions. Um, one thing, I, uh, Mayumi, one thing I would say is um, that earlier I meant to just point out to the committee that although you're going to hear uh, you're going to hear a, a, a group of different people one thing we all share is we are all patients we all have experienced the healthcare system as patients some of us might also be providers or advocates or ministers it's or parents etc but we all as individuals have experienced um, the disparities and inequity in the healthcare system all of us in this group presenting today that being said, Mayumi, is there anything else you want to share about your health experience before we move on to the next person? Any st other stories? You had mentioned one to me. I don't know if you decided not to tell that one, but. Um, well, there is another one where, um, you know, I, uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm, well, maybe I'll talk on this because this does have, this does concern mental health. Um, I lost my neighbor nearly a week ago. And he was extremely depressed. He was very sick and he was dying of liver failure. And for me, the, the fact that there was nothing I could do to get him any, any help at all whatsoever was so gut-wrenching. And the fact that there was no one from his family that was trying to get him any help whatsoever was also hard. Um, so just when you consider mental health, consider that it comes at end of life, it comes at middle of life, it comes at beginning of life. It's a, a reality for thousands of us. And for far too long, we've spent time saying that it's not important. It is important. You know, it, it impacts our well being. We know that if people don't take care of their teeth, it can lead to heart disease. I don't see why mental health would be any different. Um, and also, um, when my daughter was about two and a half, I had fibroids. And it took me two and a half years to get anyone to listen to me for the fact that I was bleeding three weeks out of the month. And I was so tired and I couldn't figure out why. And it finally took somebody who was a white healthcare worker to say something to get me an appointment with um, a really wonderful doctor who is no longer at um, the uh, UVM Women's Health Clinic. But you know, she was able to tell me what all my options were and said, you know, we'll try this treatment. If it doesn't work, we will try surgery, you know, and I tried the treatment, I think for three months, I said, it's not working for me. So we went in and I had surgery and I had, the doctors were so wonderful and caring, but the thing is, it should not have taken two and a half years for me to get the care that I needed. And the thing is, it's not unusual for any woman to not have a healthcare story like that. I can remember that my friend had a, on her feed, we were all discussing how we all had stories about our healthcare where it's not taken seriously simply because we're women and we must be hysterical. And that's not the case. If a patient tells a doctor that something's wrong, there is something wrong. And 
you know, if a man in Canada can have Gillian Barre syndrome and tell you that he's being treated for his mental health and it's all under control, but no one takes him seriously. And the fact that he's crawling outside to a cab doesn't tell you that something's wrong, it is. Thank you for, um, thank you for sharing the additional stories. Um, Cause I know when we had spoken in advance, you had told me some more and you just shared it now. And I thought it would be important for the committee to hear those direct stories of feeling that you were not, not even feeling, but not being believed by healthcare providers and, and the barriers you had to overcome to get the treatment you needed. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we're gonna move on to two other witnesses. Um, you know, we're, like I said, we're a mix of patients and providers. Often people might not think about, about the, the health care that's provided by ministers and reverends and that our health, our, our, it's not just the medical system, but so much of our health is connected to mental and spiritual health and how we're dealing with um, the, the hardships of the world and how we cope with that trauma um, through how we make meaning of it and how we come to understand it. And so I think the perspective of uh, the Reverend and the minister who are here today are important in that conversation. So I think we'll start with, it looks like um, Reverend Christopher is ready to go. So why don't you start us off and then we'll be hearing from Minister Roy. Good morning. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share with such distinguished individuals this morning. My name is Reverend Dr. Christopher Von Cockrell. I've been living now as a resident in Vermont just a little over a year now. Um, I, I have experienced health care disparities among my family, my, my wife in particular, as well as my congregants. Um, one of the problems that we have here in Vermont, being that, that, that rent is so high here for us to stay here, you have problems with that. And even though my wife did have insurance, the only insurance that she could afford did not really have a, med a medicine plan on it. And that medicine plan did not allow her, even when she was able to be diagnosed with high blood pressure, um, just a mere cost out of cost pocket for her blood pressure medicine was over $200 a month. Um, to add that with the rent that we're paying that is extremely high, with that also, even though she was working, um, we were faced with situations, can we afford to get her medicine? And, and, and that's the problem across the board. We have members that are actually sharing medicines. Well, I've got some extra pills, you know, I take the same thing. And so we're dealing with these types of situations. And not only that, transportation is a problem here. A lot of people don't have cars and so forth. So they depend on public transportation to get them to their doctor's appointment. And even though they're getting doctor transportation by the public bus system, they, they still have to walk a good distance. And for those members who are unable to walk that extra two or three blocks to get to the doctor, um, it's a situation that they have to deal with. Um, there's a myth about black women of color is that they have a high threshold of pain. And so a lot of times we're not given pain medicines in a timely manner in which we're able to, to calm these situations. Uh, we have members that, that are dealing with, that have sleep apnea. Um, they can't afford the copay for this because many, even though they do have Medicaid and Medicare, there's a copay to go along with this. And the copay, they don't have the copay money. And, and for those of us who make decent salaries, the copay of $50, $100, an extra $120 for medicine is not there. So there's the stress of that that goes along with it. Uh, we have the problem, appointments. And yes, they said, well, yes, we have free uh, clinics here. Yes, but those slots go up so quickly um, it's hard for people to get in for that. Um, with the COVID situation, we're having to do more virtual um, appointments. Well, a lot of individuals do not own computers. 
A lot of them don't even own smartphones. A lot of them have these government phones that are flip phones and don't have that um, capacity. So we're struggling with a lot of things that that just engraved in the situation. We're looking at how can we move forward and making sure that, and it's just not a people of color thing. This is a poverty thing. This is a poor people's process because poor whites deal with the same problems we do. Gays, transgender individuals, they deal with these problems. And as a state that's to be concerned about all of its citizens, we have to start taking more a pro better approaches and how do we make sure that these people do not suffer through these health care crisis in getting there. And so, yes, our numbers are higher in dying because we can't get to the health care that we need. And then there's a level of spiritual care that I work with desperately um, because of the lack of churches and household of faith. I happen to pass the only African-American Baptist church in the state of Vermont. And I still find that hard to believe. So there are a lot of people are struggling trying to find that spirituality in which to help them through these disparities. And so thank you very much for giving me these two moments to share my perspective from my personal family experience as well as those of my congregants. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. So next we're gonna have uh, Roy V. Hill. Are you ready to go, Roy? Minister Roy V. Hill. I'm not frozen, am I? Okay, good. Oh, I saw people move and I'm like, oh no, am I the one now who's frozen? Um, no, you're fine. Okay, Thanks. I'm moving. So Roy, are you ready to go, Roy? If not, we can come back to you, but... Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, it must have been my computer. Sorry about that. I'll start over. I was well oh. in my speech, quote unquote, <laughs> or sharing, you might say. Well, <clears throat> I greet those who are immigrants and descendants of immigrants who populate uh, this place we call America, Vermont in particular. I've been a Vermont resident some 32 years. I reside specifically here in Franklin County where just recently one of the residents said, quote, there is no racism in Vermont. Well, <clears throat> we, the people occupy a land that technically belongs to Native Americans. That's racism as we deny the fact of our occupancy. I stand to speak on behalf of and support H210. I am a member of the steering committee of the Vermont Racial uh, Justice Alliance, for those who may have fleeting amnesia, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance is under the leadership of a People of Color Steering Committee and assisted by a network of individuals and organizations across Vermont, across Vermont. And we place priority on policies that affect changes across a broad spectrum, including housing, education, employment, health services, economic development, the criminal justice system, and health equity. Each one of those uh, effects is affected in terms of health care. A focus, our focus is on mitigating direct impact and dismantling the root or systemic origins of racism in Vermont. You know that Act 54 affirms that with the data that shows racial disparities across all agencies, across all agencies. You see, post-1619 years in America has allowed America's structural racism and other societal norms that resulted in health disparities. Oftentimes, or most of the times I submit when cops shoot unarmed people of color. They're generated by some kind of mental disparity in their own heads, mental health, racism, crises in America. If I look at my family, and if I look at me and my wife in particular, I'm reminded of the time that I went to the doctor for the annual 
<clears throat> annual um, medical exam when I was working at Dartmouth. And the Dartmouth grad looked, MD looked at my leg and said, where did you get all those cuts, those knife cuts on your leg? Were you in a knife fight? I counted to 10 and then explained I grew up on the farm and we often did jump rope and a barbed wire fence had egregiously cut up my leg. And we didn't go to the doctor because in the South, especially during my early years, you went to the doctor when you were almost dead or dying because medical didn't want to have anything to do with you in Tennessee, which has the ranking of being number fifth, number sixth among the states known for killing and raping, killing black men, raping black women. Today, a lot of that ignorance still persists. <clears throat> Dr. Clemens, who used to work at UVM in the medical field, often talks about challenges thrown at him by his white colleagues as he was trying to bring the reality of research and truth to their attention in the curriculum. After he left, they adopted, they adopted much of what he had to say, but denied him when he was there. My wife suffers from or has been diagnosed with what's called uh, dissociative concern. And that affects uh, and brings about depression. Uh, that depression affects people across the board here in Vermont during the winter years. You know, no sunlight or little sunlight, vitamin D deficiency, etc. So it aggravates her situation. When we've gone to doctor's office, some of them have either well, they've used excuses to say, um, well, you can't come in. Uh, we're just meeting with her. She's the patient. And so I have to go through this long thing about, well, she has a dissociative. There are certain questions she will not be able to answer. There's a cultural void. There's a denial that says to us, people of color, people of African descent, we have to as white people go with the white template. And if it's not white, it ain't right. So those unnecessary pressures. Now my blood pressure is up, my stress is up as I'm trying to talk to this physician and this nurse about why it is important for them to broaden their perspective or go back to school and recognize that you may see one or two of us here as part of Vermont's majority population. But we are one or two of the 8 billion people populating planet Earth. So we are part of that majority who are people of color. But in the essence, the final in the essence, we're all people of one human race. If we talk about freedom and unity as our motto in the state of Vermont, there can be no freedom, there can be no unity if you keep your knee on my neck. So take it off. Look with will and intent to embrace and make real H210. Yes, I stand in support of H210. This bill that says, hey, let's have that office of health equity. Let's establish that health equity advisory commission and let's put money behind it. This is a capitalistic society. You and I both know, even though you are white and part of the majority and I am not. We live in a capitalistic society and when things move, it costs money. When white folk say, ouch, money grants, we say, get your knee off my neck. And you say, well, you know, let's wait a while. We'll think about it. Uh, we'll keep it in committee. And one day we'll release it from committee and we'll, well, gee whiz, let's wait until Africa, let's wait until February of next year. You know, that's uh, Black History Month and we'll do something so we can look liberal. Proverbs six is in line with the currency in America that currency says, in God we trust. Proverbs 6 speaks to the things that God hates. That's a little hard for some people in Vermont to chew on. I know that 30, almost 35% 
uh, Vermont residents are anti-church, anti-God, anti-religion, but we love that money, even though it says God we trust. Let's have more trust in each other. Let's move forward with H210. The legislative body, our legislative body says there are racial disparities across the agencies, but it isn't a fact that is confined to Montpelier. It's a fact that's found exercised in your white neighbors, your white relatives, your sisters, your brothers, and that's also good there. So let's magnify the good and go forth. Because let's face it, my brothers and my sisters in this one human race, this one human fa family, we are all marching from the womb to the tomb. So before we get to the tomb and they close the lid, you know, let's leave something behind. Some of you saw the Burlington, and I close on this note. Some of you saw the Burlington Free Press February 1 front page that talked about Bates, the sheriff in Virgins, and the fact that this first black sheriff or law enforcement person in Vermont was loved by all and respected by all of his neighbors. Let's do those things that make it possible for us to respect all of our nature, all of our neighbors. Let's embrace, illustrate, stand for freedom and unity in health care and health wellness. Amen. Thank you, Roy. I just want to take a moment to pause and acknowledge that we've heard from four witnesses, but you have to count four witnesses so far. And that our four witnesses, just I want to acknowledge that the the courage it takes as a black person to speak truth in in society and to speak truth to power, especially in a context like this, where you're being recorded for posterity and posted on the internet. And just to, to acknowledge that um, the threats that black and other brown people have what we have to live under on a regular basis. Um, and so I just wanna acknowledge you. I just wanna, I don't think we can thank you enough for coming here today virtually and sharing your stories and, and sharing the qualitative data because this is qualitative data, people's stories about why the bill needs to happen. So thank you. Um, and you also just wanna remind everyone that this bill was developed as part of an organization um, that's led by, by black and other people of color, but that centers the black experience and that the rest of us work it, to acknowledge that, to fight against anti-blackness. Um, and so um, that being said, I, we're gonna shift focus now and hear some of the quantitative data because not only has our bill and our, and our suggestions been grounded in the exp direct experiences of people and the stories we share, but, it, but also it's been grounded in findings that are rooted in quantitative data, in numbers. So I'd like to hand the floor, so to speak, over to Pat Otilio, who's um, probably, I could say, our, our main data expert in the Racial Justice Alliance. Um, I don't know if that's, if, if, if you know, I don't know if you want to be called an expert, but we view you as our as our main data person. Um, thank you for all the work that you've been doing for us, and please take it away. and um, And you have the floor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Represent Representative Gina, and uh, thank you all for having me here and giving me the opportunity to talk. And I, I also want to acknowledge uh, the other other folks who testified here and uh, their courage, and thank them for coming forward. Uh, my name is Pat Attilio. I'm a resident of Quiche. Uh, I lived in Vermont for uh, just three years now, uh, but I've been busy. <laughs> uh, I've been retired for several years uh, from a career as an IT professional, project manager, and a software engineer. And my special focus when I was working for Hewlett Packard and other companies was in, uh, in data uh, modeling, data analysis. And uh, so when I retired, I wanted to find more productive uses for that, for that expertise. And I was very happy to find Mark in the Racial Justice Alliance a couple of years ago. And I'm now a proud member of, of that group. So um, I support H210. I think it's, it's a, a very 
uh, well put together piece of legislation. Uh, but as a data person, I'm gonna speak uh, primarily to the uh, findings section, uh, which I think is very helpful. I think any conversation about um, healthcare and about uh, race um, needs to be grounded in data to know what we're talking about, to, know, to va validate the reality of it, and, um, and uh, you know, to ground ourselves in that and, uh, and help, help us convince others of the, the reality of the problem uh, for those who, who respond to data um, as opposed to qualitative testimony. So um, yeah, so uh, I, I think the, uh, the findings section is, is quite good. Uh, I did uh, uh, provide some input to that. But reviewing reviewing it, I uh, had some other comments. Now that we're we're thinking of from the healthcare standpoint, I did have some comments and additions. So I'll take a couple minutes on that. Uh, things that you know, the findings is not meant to be a total totally covering all relevant healthcare statistics <laughs> for for these communities, for BIPOC and other communities in in Vermont. But uh, there's some interesting ones and important ones, perhaps that uh, we might want to consider adding or uh, at least covering um, in the long run. Uh, one is a, so, uh, so starting on that Vermont, uh, the uninsured rate in Vermont is from what I understand, from what I can tell is, uh, is quite, uh, quite good in the aftermath of the ACA um, is, uh, compared to other states uh, Vermont's uninsured rate is pretty low. But even so, um, blacks are 25% more likely to be uninsured uh, than, than whites in, this, in the state. So uh, that's a measure that uh, perhaps we want to include here and, um, and keep track of. Um, as, I, as I mentioned some of these uh, data points, um, I, I can provide the sources. I won't belabor that uh, today, but um, uh, one of the challenges we have with presenting these findings or any, any data gathering uh, is uh, actually getting the data. So uh, I appreciate the bill containing um, uh, the stipulations that the agencies who contribute data and metrics uh, provide it disaggregated by, by, uh, by race and by uh, sexuality and by disability. That will make uh, my job and the jobs of activists and researchers in Vermont all that much easier because it's not too easy right now. Um, so, uh, COVID-19 obviously is a, is an important data area. One thing that's not mentioned here in the findings, I just thought I'd throw it out there is we are starting to get statistics around the vaccination rate in Vermont that the department of health department of health provides on a weekly basis. And I see that, uh, you know, uh, vaccination rates are chugging along, but, uh, uh, blacks and, uh, uh, Native Americans and Asians, uh, all the vaccination rates are lower than, than the white rate in Vermont. In particular, uh, whites uh, most recently are 10.5% 10 10 vaccinated and uh, blacks are 6.6% vaccinated. So that's, uh, uh, that's worth, worth pointing out. Uh, it's not in the findings. Um, Section 4C of the findings uh, mentions that uh, there's no statistically dif significant differences in the rates of pre-existing conditions, uh, including cardiovascular disease. That's not what I found when I was looking into this. So uh, uh, my understanding is that non, non, my discovery is that non-Hispanic Blacks are 50% more likely to die of heart disease. And that's a uh, CDC number, okay? So, um, um, that is a, a, you know, a significant health disparity that we don't want to lose sight of. Um, so I want to point that out. Um, some of the other important measures like uh, life, life expectancy by race, um, annual mortality by, rate by race, um, those are both um, uh, at a national level, there, there is quite a disparity. Um, um, blacks, uh, life expectancy at birth in 2016, Blacks are uh, expected to live three years less than whites. 
Um, the mortality rate is much higher. Um, black males versus white males have a 25% a higher mortality rate. Uh, black females versus white females have a 15% higher mortality rate. Those are nat nationwide figures. And here I'll point out, um, it was not easy and I have not been able to figure out what those numbers would be for Vermont. But uh, I have to imagine they would be similar. Um, so uh, let's see here, Opi opioid addiction uh, is clearly something that's a big problem in Vermont. Um, and Vermont ranks, uh, well, Vermont, so nationwide um, opioid deaths uh, in 2018 were 14.6 uh, was the rate of death per 10,000, I think that is, or maybe 100,000. But uh, the point is that it's nearly double for Vermont, um, the opioid deaths. And here again, I, I was th this I was not able to break down by race in Vermont. So uh, it would be worth looking into. And I think that's an important aspect of health care uh, or you know, mental health, uh, physical wellness, however you want to look at it. Uh, that needs to be considered uh, because it's so uh, important and a significant issue in Vermont. Um, yeah, so uh, the, uh, this opioid infant mortality rate tends to be, uh, you know, it's higher for, for people of color in this country. Um, and I, uh, again, I don't, uh, you know, oh, Vermont I have is in, uh, about a third, is a 16th best state when it comes to infant mortality statistics overall. But I was, again, not able to disaggregate that by race. So uh, another that's another common metric that one would want to have um, when, when looking into disparities. And But uh, we, I, I at least have not been able to un uncover that data. Uh, finally, um, go, kind of broadening out a bit uh, before I finish into the uh, the uh, what do you call social determinants of health? I'm glad that's in here, and um, and th this is important. That the uh, there's a lot of factors that come into determining our, our health outcomes as human beings, and uh, like the ones that were cited in the findings, I would want want to point out that uh, uh, level of educational and energy uh, achievement is important as well. It's not a huge disparity in Vermont, but uh, um, that, uh, like for example, achieving a bachelor's degree uh, is uh, whites whites are uh, two percentage points higher than blacks in terms of getting bachelor's degrees. And in terms of how does that relate to health outcomes? Well, bachelor's degrees lead to uh, better income, be, lead to better health care, leads to uh, leads to better health. So there's a direct connection between uh, education and uh, health outcomes turns out. And um, poverty rate is important to point out for similar reasons. Um, and I wouldn't wanna know the child poverty rate uh, in Vermont by race. And uh, again, I was not able to uh, track that down, but uh, we know the poverty rate is significantly different between black Vermonters and white Vermonters. Black Vermonters are more than twice as likely to live in poverty as white Vermonters, and child poverty is is uh, is also and re is related to that, and also quite important. So uh, that that sums up kind of uh, my my just getting this bill in my hands and looking through the the findings here. Um, and to some in, in some there, you know, we want to want to be sure we're tracking all the critical metrics so we can prioritize what we should be focusing our efforts on. So again, thank you for uh, for allowing me this time and to give that some feedback. Thank you, Pat. And, uh, and you know, I, I especially appreciate the point you're making um, around how, although we have provided in this bill some findings demonstrating the need for action to address disparities and to promote health equity, that this is just the beginning of the information and that a yeah. lot more is needed for us to understand the full picture Yep. Um, and that's why we have data collection in the bill. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And also for pointing out that we can try to change the system itself and work on how we're treating, but mm -hmm. 
but that there's so much more we can do for prevention when we look at social determinants of health, because that is needs to be part of the discussion. So speaking of the, yeah, so thank you. So speaking of the bigger picture, um, and sort of to wrap things up for us in our testimony today, we have Mark Hughes, who's going uh, to join us at this point. Um, so last but not least, the bases are loaded, Mark. Bring somebody home. Take it away. Well, that's that's encouraging. It's it's also intimidating, you know, because I could just strike out. Um, but um, I just want to thank. Um, I want to first. I want to acknowledge um, Representative uh, Cordes's um, uh, tenacity and uh, and her uh, just uh, intestinal fortitude just to keep her hand up for the duration of an hour and a half. Um, because I've been watching that and I'm thinking, man, she must be tired. Uh, so, um, Chair, um, uh, Chairman uh, Lippert, it's good to see you. Thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to come into your committee on the fast track. Good to have you here. Um, we do have a connection uh, and a history with uh, the chair. Uh, there are others on the committee uh, that um, I really appreciate and respect your work. I, I also uh, want to just give a shout out uh, to, uh, maybe she's gone. Um, I, I think, oh, there you are. Representative Taylor Small, uh, give you a shout out. I see you and, uh, and just congratulate you. So just you know, briefly, just in high level, I, I'm not gonna go in, in a lot into the bill, but I just wanna tie some stuff together for you real quick. And uh, if, if, if it's possible, and I, also Katie, I wanna thank you too and, and for the work you've done. I've been watching, I've been watching what you've been doing, Katie. And if, if it's possible to give me an opportunity, if I can get to it over, over the next eight minutes, what I'll do is I'll maybe share a slide uh, as well. So if you can afford me that opportunity to do so, I'd appreciate it. Um, you know, as far as the Alliance, the Racial Justice Alliance, we're doing um, a lot of things at the same time. We're working on platform initiatives, which includes ACT Act. Uh, I think some of you have heard about Act, uh, statewide policy. There's also, um, you know, community engagement and support. There's outreach and education. There's cultural empowerment. A lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, obviously, I think a lot of folks know about the scaffolding that we've laid uh, for the, um, the discussion on systemic racism. One of our colleagues and member of the board of directors mentioned to you just a minute ago, um, Act 54, which many, some of you have forgotten, some of you probably never heard of, 2017, that was formerly known as the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel, which still exists today. You, you see a time from time to time there. Um, well, what also came out of that was the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's Task Force report which reported racial disparities across all systems of state government. That was before we learned the vernacular systemic racism. Um, and we introduced that vernacular in, type, in Act 9 uh, in, um, in two, special session 2018, where we created Susanna Davis's position as well as the racial equity panel. Okay, so that's kind of a little bit of the background of the work we've been doing, but we didn't stop doing that work. So we're still moving stuff forward and we've you know, been continuing to work you know, in the criminal justice system as well as all systems across state government. And what we've come to understand over the last couple of years is kind of like Dr. King's been saying the entire time is, is you cannot fix this without a radical redistribution of political and economic power, hard stop. So what we've been looking at this session is, is eliminating these obstacles to economic opportunity. Um, we've, we've been looking at home and land ownership as well as wellness, which is the center of this entire conversation, because it's a broad sweeping representative Donahue, I know you know what I'm talking about. It's a really broad sweeping conversation. When you talk about wellness, that means wholeness, that's everything. Uh, we've also been talking about COVID-19 relief, um, targeted intentional attention in terms of uh, COVID-19 relief. I don't think anybody who's, who's around last session could agree that we did a good job at that in terms of the targeted uh, relief. And, and, and in fact, I, I don't even think anybody can agree that we're administering the vaccine in a targeted manner uh, today. Uh, the last piece is, is, is uh, cultural empowerment because that's where we find our history. That's where we find our culture. That's where we find our relevance. That's where we find our contribution. That's where we find our resilience. That's where we find a component of our wellness as people, people of African descent. So that's incredibly important, even as it pertains to wellness. So I'll just go on and just briefly share with you 
Um, just a couple slides just to give you some background, but I'm just, just trying to tie it all together before we talk briefly about the, um, the, the, the policy itself. Now the policy, you know, obviously there's, there's a hope uh, that, that we get the opportunity to get some additional testimony in. I mean, that's, that's somewhat of a no brainer, I would imagine. Um, there is a hope uh, that, uh, you know, that we'd be able to get some different perspectives to the table to talk about this policy because there's, there's still work to be done. There's still stuff that needs to be done in this policy. We realize that. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that this, the appropriate stakeholders will come to the table, we'll have additional conversation about this, we'll move this forward. Um, so I just wanted to share with you briefly about, you know, you, we talked a lot about the, the mental wellness or the wellness working group of the, the Racial Justice Alliance in this group. It's a pretty diverse group. And what we're, what we're really focusing on is, is um, enabling folks the ability to live daily enjoying their highest levels of wellness, okay? This, this, is, this is involving creating and managing what we're referring to as disruptive initiatives. Why, why do we refer to it as disruptive? Because the system wasn't created to accommodate black folks. It just wasn't, it's not broken. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, the other thing is a developing long range strategy. So just wanted to make sure that you got that as proper framing kind of heading into this policy because we agreed that this policy was going to be a component of the work that we do. Briefly, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> we, um, we, speak, we speak about determinants and I just wanted to just elaborate on that because we're, we're, there's a lot of conversation about determinants and they are somewhat divergent and we are creating we have created a list of determinants here uh, within the um, uh, our, our own working group, and, and and many of those have been communicated outwards uh, to um, uh, to the uh, racism is a public health emergency uh, group here in Chittenden County, and so the, these uh, determinants have, are reflected re reflected in that group as well. So what I'm showing you here is is you know, how how we're framing the impact. Thank you. How we're framing the impact. Um, that these, what we refer to as social determinants, and they are derivatives of what you've seen in this particular policy, but we've got to emphasize the fact that, you know, the, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 is not necessarily the, um, the, the, the public health emergency. Racism is the public health emergency. And I just want to pause there for a minute and let you know, you will see a declaration, you will see a request for a joint resolution from the House and Senate to declare it as such, because that is a pre-existing condition that has always impacted every single one of these determinants. So I just wanted to make it very clear, yes, COVID is alive and well, yet, but it is exacerbating a pre-existing condition. Very important to understand in the conversation we're having in terms of wellness, because the conversation about wellness, it involves all of those determinants as they bear down on black and brown folks and as they are, as they're, they're bearing down with their natural uh, inequities of uh, inequitable outcomes um, that are now exacerbated by COVID-19. So I'll just share with you that yes, you will see a, a request. I'm asking your endorsement on that. Um, the um, declaration, or if you will, a, I, should, I should say a resolution of uh, racism as a public health emergency. That will be forthcoming. I'll be talking to the pro tem at some point or another. It's public now, so everybody knows. Um, and we'll be getting back to the, the speaker as well, talking more about that. It's going to happen. Uh, and, and if you can't do it, we'll ask the governor to do it. Um, regarding this policy, um, I do feel um, that, do I have the right policy in my hand? Regarding this policy, um, I think the, um, you know, there's one thing that's dramatically missing from this policy. What is it? Money. There's no money in this policy. So we, I want you to know, we flag that. Uh, I think we got to, you know, this is, some, this is something that I, I'm, I'm confident you're going to do. I, I, here's what I believe is going to happen. You're going to go in, you're going to get testimony from other folks. There are going to be other versions of policies that are similar to this. There'll be overlaps. There will be things that, there will be testimonies. Folks will agree. Folks will not agree. At the end of the day, we're going to come up with a policy. At the end of the day, I am asking you, Put some money on this policy. Put about $3 million on this policy. Put about $3 million on this policy to pay. You talk about an office of racial, of, of equity, of health, but 
you can't, it's kind of like, you know, the Office of Racial Equity. How's that working out for us? Okay, so put some money, uh, put some money on this, get a few million dollars on it, get a few people, butts and chairs. Uh, and also, in addition to that, um, you talk about grants, put the money in place. Okay, so that's what I'm really recommending that you do here. In closing, I just say that um, there's been a lot of work that's gone into this already, but it's not all of the work. We acknowledge that. We acknowledge that. Um, I encourage you to take additional testimony on this. We may even come back and change our mind on some of our own propositions, you know? Um, and Bill, you said, I mean, said, um, Mr. Chairman, you've seen this a thousand times. So, so but I am confident that um, this is headed in the right direction. I, I think there is an imperative. Um, this is an emergency. The house is on fire. And so I'm asking you to take some action, take this up. I want to thank Representative uh, China for his tireless work in, in everything he does. You have no idea, committee, uh, of the work he does behind the scenes working with us and putting up with me, uh, quite frankly. Um, and Brian, don't you? <laughs> and so I want to thank you uh, publicly. Um, but I also want to thank the work, thank the folks in this committee. I want to thank the folks of the working group of the Racial Equity uh, the Racial Justice Alliance. I want to thank the Board of Directors of the Racial Justice Foundation, um, all of the folks who contributed to this, the data folks, Pat, you and your folks, all of the effort that's gone into this thus far, because we still got some work to do. And I want to commit to you that we will partner with you to help you get this thing over the line. So just, you know, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. I wish you all a great afternoon. And, um, uh, Representative Gina, I guess it's back to you. I, I would just say thank you, Mark, and thank you all of our witnesses for making time out of your lives to come talk today. And um, just like Mark mentioned, all the work that I've done that people don't see, that every person you see you you heard from today is doing massive amounts of unpaid labor um, to for the betterment of not only their lives, but their community and the greater society that we live in. So thanks to everyone. Thanks to all the people who are not here today who helped work on this bill. It really does represent um, the work of dozens of people um, in our community and more, and hopefully more if we take it up for further action. So um, I'll just stop there and say thank you. And I'll, I'm not the chair of this committee, so I'm not gonna try and manage the questions. So thanks for letting me at least uh, present my witnesses though. Right, well, I wanna, I wanna thank Brian and but particularly I wanna thank uh, Mark and the other witnesses who've come to spend their time with us today uh, and as you acknowledged, who are doing a lot of work uh, in so many areas, but this being one of the key areas. Um, and I want to, I want to, I want to also acknowledge uh, the work that Brian and, and Katie have done uh, at my request to move this bill uh, so we could bring it to our committee's attention and in our deliberations, um, as we as we both uh, look at policy issues and also budget issues. So uh, it's important that we have this in front of us. You know, I, I am, uh, I'm aware of the time uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to not try to begin a committee discussion at this point in time. We are so close to the, to the noon hour. There's much to be said. There's, uh, I think, I think it will not profit us to, to try to uh, engage right now. Um, but let me let me check in with committee members. Uh, can, can we, would committee members um, be willing to take 10, 10 minutes more of our time into the lunch hour to entertain questions if there are questions at this point? I would in the, I have just two things that I wanna put on the table while we have all of these amazing witnesses here for a, a discussion. We have witnesses with us, and let's take advantage of that. Okay, let's do, let's let's take a few more. Let's take a little more time, uh, and uh, and then we'll we'll see where we are. Uh, Representative Cordes. Thank you. Before I ask my two, I think fairly quick questions, I also want to take a moment to honor and acknowledge the emotional, physical, mental, spiritual labor um, from all of you and all of the people that are not here with us that have um, worked on this and shared your skills, your 
um, lived experience um, to a group of people who historically have devalued um, you. Um, I acknowledge and honor that. My, the two things I'd like to talk about, um, and Mark Hughes, you um, were saying that uh, this, you acknowledge that this, we're just beginning with this bill, um, at least as far as this committee goes. Um, so I hear that. Um, my two concerns are the phrase non-white, which the first use of it is on page two under the findings. Um, and I, I um, would appreciate hearing what your process was in um, putting that, potentially putting that into statute and therefore institutionalizing that term, um, which I believe is problematic in that it normalizes white as the dominant culture and others, everyone else. And then um, the other thing that I hope we can work on is inviting um, not just physicians to do continuing education, but um, nurses, respiratory therapists. So I look forward to taking testimony from um, other healthcare professionals in how, the, how we can include the continuing education uh, for them as well. Again, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Brian, do you wanna comment? And yeah, I no. think I can answer those questions really quickly that okay. we use none white in the, in the legislation because data is collected that way in Vermont, not all data, but some data. And so if we had to present our findings, we wanted to define explain what non-white means. And we also make a statement in the definition about critiquing about the, the, the use of that word. So if you read the language, we actually critique in our definition, critique the use of the word and say, we're only using it because that's how data is collected in some areas. The second piece, we did have some um, additional pieces for health education that didn't make it into the final draft in the, in the shuffle at the end of fast tracking the bill. So I'm happy to bring that language to committee if we decide to work on the bill and I, we may enhance that language, but that's why that's not in there. So that's my quick answer. Okay. Um, Mark, do you want to make a comment? I would, thank you. Um, Representative Cortez, I, I think that's a great observation and I, I happen to be in agreement with you. And, and I think that we will find additional language um, throughout this bill that may not be the language that we want to land on. Uh, so this is a starting place. Uh, I know that um, you know later on in the bill when we start talking about social determinants, I'm not quite settled with that yet. You know, with that, you know, based upon the slide that I showed you, um, we should. I think there should be additional uh, testimony, debate, uh, so on and so forth. Get other people's perspectives. Maybe this is where it lands. Don't know. And then I'll just conclude with saying. You know, there's this conversation about over on page 15 of 28, uh, item number um, L2 about Office May. Office May, are you kidding me? I mean, uh, so I, I think that, um, you know, we might want to talk about what, what, you know, shall and what may, the difference between those as well. So there's, and that's one thing I've learned over the last several years messing around walking the halls of the state house is, is you, you misplace one shell with one may, you're out of luck. Uh, so, so there's a lot of, um, <laughs> there's a lot to yet to cover in this. And that's why, you know, my opening was, is we're not there yet. Um, we hope there's more testimony that comes in and, um, you know, we're happy to continue to collaborate on this and, and maybe some of the changes, maybe changes to our own. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to have us finish with that comment. Um, uh, given where we are this after, this morning and now this afternoon. Um, I think this has been a good start. And as it's been indicated, this is not uh, a finished, uh, we, we, will, we will take more testimony. Uh, we will have time for committee discussion and also to look at uh, uh, money and budget implications. Uh, but this, I again, I greatly appreciate uh, the work that has been done to put this in front of us. So. Mr. Chairman, if, if I may be allowed, uh, just one last comment. I, again, I want to I want to really thank the committee and I want to I cannot I cannot overemphasize the gravity uh, that this particular policy uh, brings uh, to this to the table in terms of the, you know, the 
the summation of the efforts that we're making this legislative term to advance this um, this 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 um, this approach that we're taking in addressing systemic racism. Um, wellness is at the center of everything, yeah. which is why this bill, you know, comes before uh, anything else that we're doing. We are so much appreciate, um, Mr. Chairman, um, your support in getting this thing out front and enabling us to be able to communicate this in the way in which we have. Uh, I hope folks, I hope folks watch this testimony over and over and over again. But if this is not working, um, then we've got big problems everywhere else, and everything else is informing this. So I hope that the work of the, of the committee is not just blinded by the fact that there are a lot of other factors involved, involved surrounding housing, employment, uh, home ownership, um, not just health services access, but economic development, and and right. you know all of the other systems. So. Um, I do appreciate, again, I do appreciate what you're doing uh, by taking this up. And I just want to just leave that, the gravity of how important this policy is to advancing the work on whole. Uh, and um, so I encourage you to, um, to take the testimony and, and I appreciate um, having the opportunity to come out and be a part of this. So, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you to all of our other witnesses uh, and to Representative Chena for uh, taking the lead on sponsoring this bill. We're gonna have plenty of time. Well, plenty of time. We're gonna have time. Um, we never have enough time as we as much time as we'd like, but we have all the time that we have uh, that we can uh, prioritize our, our, our work. And with that, um, I look forward to some robust committee discussion as well as uh, looking at the bill more closely uh, when we take it up formally. But today was a important first step in that process. So thank you all. Uh, for committee members, uh, let me, we can go off YouTube at this point. 